ಚಾಕ್ಷಡನ್ಮಿಲಿತ್ರೀಕುರೇ <coughs> ರಾಧಾಕುಂದಂ ಗಿರಿಬರಂ ಮಹೋ ರಾಧಿಕ ಮಧಾವ ಪ್ರಾಪ್ತೀತೃಪಾಯಗುರು ತಂ ನತಸ್ಮೆ ಪಂಚಕಲ್ಪತರೂಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾಸಿಂಧುವ್ಯೈ ಪತೀತೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ನಿಖಿಲಾಶ್ರುತಿ ಮೌಲಿ ರತ್ನಮಾಲದಿತಿ ನಿರಾಜಿತ ಪದ ಪಂಕಜಂತ ಆಜಿ ಮುಕ್ತಕುಲೈರುಪಶ್ಯಾಮನಂ ಪರಿತಷ್ಟ ಹರಿನಾಮ ಸಂಶ್ರಯಾಮಿ ಅನಾರ್ಪಿತ ಚಿಂ ಚಿರಾತ್ಕರುಣಯಾವತಿರ್ನ ಕಲು ಕ್ಷಮಾರ್ಪಯಿತು ಮುನ್ನತೋಜ್ವಲರಾಸಂಸಭಕ್ತಿ ಶ್ರಿಯ ಹರೀ ಪುರತ ಸುಂದರಾದ್ಯುತಿಕದಂಬಸಂದೀಪಿ ಸದಾ ಹೃದಯ ಕಂದರೇಶಂದನ ಅಜಾನುಲಂಬಿತ ಭುಜೋ ಕನಕಾವದಾತೋ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನೈಕಪಿತರೋ ಕಮಲಾಹೇತಕ್ಷು ವಿಶ್ವಂಬರೋ ದ್ವಿಜಾವರೋ ಜುಗಧಾರ್ಮ ಪಾಲೋ ವಂದೇ ಜಗತ್ ಪ್ರಿಯಕರೋ ಕರುಣಾವತಾರೋ ಲಾದಿನಿ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಸ್ವರೂಪಾಯ ಗೌರಂಗ ಶ್ರೀದಾಯ ಭಕ್ತ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಪ್ರದನಾಯ ಗದಾಧರ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧೋ ದಿನ ಬಂಧೋ ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗುಪೀಕ ಕಂತರಾಧಾ ಕಂತ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ರಾಧೇ ಬೃಂದವನಾಧೀಶೆ ಕರುಣಾಮೃತವಾಹಿನಿ ಕೃಪಯ ನಿಜ ಪಾದಬ್ಜ ದಶನ್ಮಯ ಪ್ರದೀಯತ ಭಕ್ತ ಅಪರಾಧಲಕ್ಷಾಯ ಕ್ಷಿಪ್ತ ಸಕಮಾತೀತರಂಗಮಾಧ್ಯೆ ಕೃಪಾಮಯಿ ತ್ವಂ ಶರಣ ಪ್ರಪಾನ ವೃಂದೇನ್ಮಸ್ತೆ ಶರಣಾರವಿಂದ ವೃಂದೇನ್ಮಸ್ತೆ ಶರಣಾರವಿಂದ ಶ್ರೀಲ ಗುರುದೇವ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಮನ್ ಮಹಾಪ್ರಭು ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಹರಿನಾಮ ಸಂಕೀರ್ತನ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೋರ್ ನಿತ್ಯನಂದ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ಗೋರ್ ಗದಾಧರ್ ಜೀವ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಶ್ರೀ ರಾಧ ಗೋವಿಂದ ದೇವ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗ್ರಂಥರ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತನ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಸ್ತುತ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ಅನಂದ ಧಾಮ್ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗೋರ್ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಗೋರ್ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅಗೇನ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಮಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚಂದ್ರ ಪ್ರಭು ಕಿ ಎಸ್ ಅಲಾವ್ ಅಸ್ ಟು ಸೊ ಅಸ್ ವಿ ಮೆನ್ಷನ್ ಎಸ್ ಡೇ ಟು ಡೇ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಬಿಗಿನಿಂಗ್ ಅವರ್ ಮಾಂಡೇ ಆನ್ ದ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಇನ್ ಅನಂದ ಧಾಮ್ and i will continue with the series of lectures i've been giving actually for the last three months or so so which is related to the prayers of brahma called brahma stuti so today this is lecture number 30 so you can imagine there is something before this 
So I'll try to give a brief summary of what we have seen in the last 29 classes <laughs> in a few minutes. Let's see how it works. <laughs> and then we will continue from here. Now the prayers of Brahma are 40 prayers. So today we are in verse 28. So still we have like 12 verses to go. So to give some context to this, uh, Brahma Stuti means the prayers of Brahma. And these prayers comes after a famous section in the Bhagavatam called Brahma Vimohan Lila, which is found in the 13th chapter of the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam. It's a very interesting section, uh, which revolves a lot about Sakyarasa. The, the, Shrima, the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam has, we could say, three emotional circles around which certain different sections revolve, uh, cor corresponding with the ages of Krishna, Kumar, Poganda, and Kishore. Well, these three ages of Krishna have to do with his life revolves around certain bhav. Now, when he's a Kumar, when he's an infant, his life revolves around. You tell me. You have your own experience when you were an infant, Mother two or three father. years. What's Salya? Exactly. And when you are two, three years, you don't have friends and, and, and so on, right? Still. Although nowadays, I, I've seen. Facebook profiles of boys of three months or something made by their parents, but that's another thing. <laughs> In normal life, <laughs> your, li your life revolves around father, mothers when you are an infant. So the same happens with Krishna. He's performing Naralila. Then when you are a child or, or a boy, basically, your life revolves around your friends, mm -hmm. Sakya. And when you become a teenager, Cupid appears on a scene. No? Mm -hmm. and Madhuri appears <laughs> exerting its influence so here in this section of the Bhagavatam Krishna is in his Foganda age which is his boyhood so the Lila's narrated in this section Agasur Lila Brahma Vimohan Lila Denukasur Lila and so on so many others from chapters 11 till almost 17, 18 this revolve around his friends and, and the relationship with them so this part of that section so how this happens, how this Bimohan, Brahma Bimohan Lila means the bewilderment of Brahma. And Brahma is a very, as you know, sober figure. He's a, <laughs> sometimes called the grandfather Brahma, the architect of the whole cosmos, uh, the most ancient person in the universe, very intelligent, four heads, thinking in north, south, east, west, very thinking person. But in this lila, he will be bimohan, means bewildered. His four heads will be spinning like this. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four. <laughs> so what's the background of this? Because these prayers come after Brahma's bimohan. So we have to travel for a minute to the very beginning of one creation cycle, which Brahma, as you may recall, is in a lotus, finding himself by himself, looking for his source and going down the, how do you say the, the stem of the lotus, looking for his own source, not finding anything, returning to the lotus, and hearing this famous syllable, tapa, 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 which basically means fire, we could say. <laughs> and this fire means close your senses and turn inward. Hmm. That's, that means to enter the fire. Hmm? Close your eyes and see. <laughs> so he did that. Hmm? And eventually, long story short, Krishna appears. Krishna gives darshan to Brahma, gives different instructions. And at one point, Krishna is shaking hands with Brahma, like a friend will do with another friend. And Brahma, he's seeing Krishna, he's realizing he's my father, he's my guru, he's God, many things. And he's treating me like a friend. And Brahma said, I like this. So in one verse of the Bhagavatam, Brahma expresses, I would like to be your friend, basically. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur comments in the purple, here Brahma is expressing longing for Sakya Bhava. <coughs> so Krishna will say, Tatashtu, okay, so be it. <laughs> so then the, some ages pass, <laughs> Brahma continue with his universal affairs. And we are in Dwapara Yuga a few thousand years back, and Krishna is with his friends in Vrindavan when he's appearing on earth to execute his Nara, perform his Nara Lila. And he's with his group of friends in this 
Poganda period, and they're about to have their first picnic in the forest. So you can imagine for a group of friends, they were always eating at home under the watchful eye of mother, father, no? trapped by their, <laughs> this, how to say this, shackles of their affection, but Salia, they couldn't go too far. No? Father will come here, return. But now they have their first picnic all by themselves in the forest. So you can imagine the excitement of the boys. Now we have the whole forest for us, no, no limits. Nobody can tell us anything. We can do whatever we want. So they are like overflowing in Sakyabab, basically. <laughs> <clears throat> so they sit in a circle, circle of friends, Sakyamandal, and they start to have picnic. No? And of course, as you can imagine, the picnic in Vrindavan, Krishna is there, his friends are there. It's not a very formal situation. This is not the, the Krishna that Brahma saw at the beginning of creation. The beginning of creation, Brahma saw Krishna, but Krishna appeared with Gopavish dressed as a cowherd, but he was joining Gyan Mudra, and some, he was presenting himself more in a guru like Aishwarya, Aishwarya on some level of Aishwarya. He was dressed as a cowherd, so that's not so Aishwaric, but instructing him in a very sober way, Gyan Mudra, so there was kind of a, a, a mixture of moods. So that was the idea, Brahma had that idea, okay, that's Krishna. So then return, now he goes to Vrindavan because why he goes to Vrindavan before this picnic or they were about to do the picnic but Agasura came on this Agasura Lila. I won't describe it all in detail but this huge python that wanted to swallow Krishna and his friends and we know how it all ends. The friends enter hmm, by the arrangement of Lila Shakti, Jogama. Krishna enters, Agasura closes his mouth and eventually hmm, Krishna suffocates Agasura from inside. He goes out and Agasura, the Atma of Agasura enters Krishna's body. And this is like a huge uh, event. All the devas come to earth to see what happened. And this huge demon has been killed by Krishna and all the devas throwing flowers. So Brahma, from Brahma Lok here, there's a big commotion on earth. So let's go there. Let's see what's going on. It has to do with Krishna. He said, oh, my guru. Let's see my guru. So he goes to see his guru on earth, expecting to hear this formal structure, but he sees something different. Hmm? But remember, he wanted Sakya Bhav. So Krishna will give him now a trailer of Sakya Bhav. <laughs> a glimpse of that. So Brahma comes and he sees Krishna with a circle of friends in full informality. In a picnic, a picnic is not a formal meeting. So Krishna is not God there. He's something more than God. That's our that's our God, Krishna. God beyond God. <laughs> so Krishna is having a picnic with his friends and he's eating with his left hand, breaking the Vaishnava etiquette. <laughs> and his friends are eating with left hand and tasting something. I say, wow, this is so good, Krishna. You have to taste it. I'm putting that on the mouth of Krishna, their own remnants in the mouth of Krishna. And Krishna is, wow, this is good. And he's tasting and putting it in the mouth of his friends. And Brahma is watching all this say, what's going on here? This is not God. This is not my guru. And, and Brahma is a very puck up follower of all rules and regulations. One name of Brahma is Bhiti. Bhiti means rules and regulations. <laughs> I to say it in the bottom that if you perform, if you follow all the rules from the Barna Ashram for 100 lifetimes without failing in anything, which is almost impossible to conceive, you are born as Brahma. For you to give an idea how much Brahma is a, knows how to do everything in a proper way. <laughs> so here you have this personification of making things correct, rules, and seeing this situation with all rules are being broken <laughs> by the force of love. My Guru Mahesh likes to say, when there are rules, there is no love. When there's love, there are no rules. Or love is creating its own rules, if you will. That's the idea. No? So this is what, uh, <laughs> this is what uh, Brahma is saying now. So he starts to become like bewildered. That's the very beginning of his bewilderment. No? All this is seen and he thinks, this is not my guru. This is not the person I saw at the beginning of creation. This must be an imposter. Playing like if he's Krishna. So I'll show that. So what he tries to do, as we know, he tries to to kidnap Krishna's friends 
and Krishna's calves. You know? The calves were there with Krishna and his friends. I'm making, I'm summarizing as much as I can. 30 classes. <laughs> so at one point, Brahma thinks he kidnapped them and put them in a cave. And he goes to his, to his plant, Brahma Lok. So one second in Brahma Lok is like a lot here, one year here. So he goes there and Krishna, he feels, oh, well, he understood Brahma did some mischief. So what he did is, because for a whole year, all the boys and cats will be disappeared. That will be an anxiety for everyone in Vrindavan. So Krishna himself expanded as each one of those friends, as each one of those cops for a whole year. And nobody in Vrindavan noticed that, interestingly. <laughs> and with that, Krishna showed how much he knew each of his devotees. He did not only replicate them physically, but with the whole emotions and thoughts and nature. So he showed how much he knew the hearts of every one of them. And also the parents in Vrindavan, fathers and mothers, they cherish very deeply to have Krishna as their own child. So during this whole year, he gave them that opportunity because he became each one of those boys. And each father and mother of Vrindavan had Krishna as their child for a year. And the same with the cows. All the cows wanted to have Krishna as their calf, if you will. <laughs> and he became the calf for a whole year. <laughs> for, so the, the, he was satisfying all the... But Sali Air Camp and all those different areas in Vrindavan. So after a year, almost when the year is over, hmm, Balaram is there in Vrindavan. And Balaram is saying, something strange is going on here. Hmm? Something strange is going on. And what's that strange thing? He's seeing all these calves and boys that were Krishna's expansions, but Balaram didn't know that. So he would think, all these fathers and mothers are loving their child, their children, more than Krishna. They didn't know he was, they were Krishna. So this shouldn't happen because in Vrindavan, everyone loves Krishna more than anyone else. And why the cows are loving their calves more than Krishna or as Krishna? That's, and Bra Balaram himself is saying, I myself am feeling that I love these boys and calves as I love Krishna. That's strange because... I always love Krishna the most. So eventually Krishna showed him that actually that those are me. <laughs> it's an expansion of myself. So anyhow, a whole year passes like this in Vrindavan. And, ba and Brahma returns from Brahma Lok. He went for a minute and returned. And when he returns, he hopes, okay, after one earthly year, all the Vrindavan will be in anxiety and these boys are kidnapped. And I will show to everyone that this boy were an, was an imposter, not Chris, but he sees that everything continues as normal. So first head of Rama starts to spin. Vimohan means the forehead spinning, but first one here. And then he goes to the cave. And it's said that those boys and calves in the cave were an illusory expansion that Krishna made an arrangement to Brahma to think he kidnapped them. So Brahma goes to the cave and the boys and the calves are there. So he goes back to Raj, and the boys and the calves are there. And he goes back to the cave, and the boy. So he's running as quick as he can because he's thinking maybe Krishna is taking them when I'm going to the other place and putting them there. And he, but not in the both place. So the second head head of Rama starts to spin. <laughs> now is Mohan, Mohan Lila. Now then comes B Mohan, which is way more. So at one point, with Brahma is saying, "What's going on with these calves and these boys?" And at, the, at that precise moment, from each one of these boys and from each one of these calves, manifestations of God appear, Vishnus appear from each one of these boys. From each one of these boys, millions of Narayans and Brahmas worshipping those Narayans. And Brahma is looking that. Brahma is watching himself worshipping Narayan. <laughs> and millions of Narayans from each one of those boys. And so a huge... Uh, manifestation of Aishwarya. It's, technically speaking, there's the place where you find more Aishwarya is Vrindavan. Mm. There's more Aishwarya in Vrindavan than in Baikuntha. Even. Mm. But it's in the background, generally. It's not required for the daily loving interaction, but it's there. Because if you don't have Aishwarya, you cannot have Madhurya. Well, Krishna Chandra Prabhu told me you were studying Raghavarma Chandrika recently. So Vishwanath Chakravartaku makes that point there in one section. For you to have intimacy, you have to have this background of Aishwarya. If not, it becomes something ordinary. So 
So Brahma is watching this extreme expression of Aishwarya, majesty, which was only shown to, 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 to Brahma, not to the rest of the Brajavasis, because it will be maybe, maybe disturbing for them too much, Aishwarya. You won't find higher highest point of Aishwarya in the whole Bhagavatam on, on this particular point. And in this point, also a very important point is being made, which has to do with the Paribas Sutra of the Bhagavatam. Which is Krishna's to Bhagavan Soyan. This very ruling line of the whole Bhagavatam around which the whole text is to be understood. And Srila Jiva Goswami wrote the whole Sandarva, Krishna Sandarva, to explain that line. Some people may tell, You Gaudias are, are making too much of one single line. <laughs> You're taking this line, one line from one verse. No, of the Bhagavatam and making your whole theology around that. How you can make so much of one line? Jiva Goswami said, here you have, how can I make so much of one line? Krishna Sandarva. Whole treatise <laughs> explaining how much is in that line. No? In the words of Srila Prabhupada, Krishna is the supreme personality of God. Here, no? Or the fountainhead of all sources of divinity. Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam means even Krishna is the source of God. <laughs> Because God is Narayan, Vishnu is God. Krishna is something more. That's an important point. Krishna is not an aspect of God, but God is an aspect of Krishna. That's our Gaudiya theology. That's interesting. <laughs> Krishna is not an aspect of God. God is an aspect of Krishna. Narayan is an Anga. An aspect of Krishna. Brahma will make that point in these prayers. Narayana Anga. Narayana is your Anga. It's an aspect of you. The limb of, of you, Krishna. <laughs> you are the source of God. Wow. <laughs> so Brahma is seeing this now. He's realizing yeah. Krishna is the source of God. But five minutes before, Brahma thought, this boy is an imposter. So try to imagine the, the extreme conversion he's going through <laughs> from thinking you are an imposter to realizing you are the source of God <laughs> so third head of Rama is spinning full speed at this point but still we have one more head left <laughs> oh, right <laughs> so what happens after this extreme <clears throat> manifestation of Aishwarya all this disappears wraps up and the only thing that remains is Krishna with the, with the morsel of food in his left hand as he was, when he was looking for his friends, when Brahma kidnapped the boys and cats, Krishna started like to, to look for them. And Brahma left. Brahma returned, all this happened, and all, all this Aishwarya disappeared. And again, Krishna remains as, as in initially like, like looking for his friends. And Brahma's realizing all this expression is coming from that little boy. No? <laughs> all these unlimited Narayans and universes and Brahmas. He is the source of all this. And he's like, looking for his friends. Mm -hmm. So the fourth head of Brahma starts to spin fully. <laughs> Brahma be more and Lila. And Brahma was in his swan at that, moment, at that moment. It is said that the devas never touched the ground on earth because they belong to another category altogether. But at this point, Brahma fell, fell, fell from his swan and put his head on the ground of Braj, of Brajaraj. <laughs> and he falls at the feet of Krishna and starts to cry deeply realizing the offense he has just committed and start to offer pranam with his four heads taking turns one head another head another head and bathing krishna's feet with his tears and doing abhishek to his feet with full repentance and after that he starts to pray and this is the brahma stuti that we are studying now these prayers that come after what i'm sure i've just shared with you in summary so there are 40 verses very beautiful. In these 40 verses, Brahma is basically establishing all our Gaudiya Siddhanta in a very systematic way. And, and it's increasing. A verse after verse after verse, Brahma is expressing more and more. Remember, he wanted Sakya Bhav. No? So Brahma, Krishna showed him, here is Sakya Bhav. <laughs> he threw Brahma in the picnic. <laughs> but Brahma was too much. He was not able to, to digest the whole thing. So he didn't pass the test fully. <laughs> but at the same time, he's still attracted to that. He's now rediscovering Krishna because he knew Krishna he met he thought he knew Krishna it's like when Uddhava went to Vrindavan before going to Vrindavan he knew Krishna or he thought he knew but when he met the Brajavasis 
and he met their love for Krishna, he realized, I don't know that Krishna. I don't know that love. And I don't know the Krishna that corresponds with that love. Because every form of God corresponds with a certain type of love. So Uddhava was in Vrindavan feeling, I don't know Krishna. I thought I knew Krishna. They know Krishna. I am starting to rediscover my Krishna with that thought. So Brahma, similarly, I met him in the beginning of creation, and now I'm realizing who he actually is. So in his prayers, he will establish all these important points, no? The, the importance of bhakti, jnan, sunya, bhakti, many famous verses there. Or jnana, priyasa, mudapa, senamanta. Many, many of the most important verses of the Bhagavatam are in this particular section. So Brahma has already till now, again, today we'll see verse 28. So in the first 27 verses, Brahma established the, the supremacy of Krishna's form which seems small, which seems medium-sized, but it's all-pervading. Brahma just realized this a minute ago. Uh, and through this, he's also uh, dismissing uh, Advaita Vat and establishing Gaudiya Vedanta, Chinta Veda Ved, and Bhakti above Karma Gyan, and so on. So many, many points have been established in all this, and we are just about to finish one section of the prayers, because there are 40 verses, but there are sections there. So today we will reach the last verse of one section. And from tomorrow on, we will enter almost into the last section of the prayers, where Brahma will focus into the into his longing for Brajabhav. And he will start to praise Vrindavan and the Brajabhasis. That will be tomorrow. Today, a little bit more regarding that. Yeah, yeah. So please tolerate me one more day. <laughs> I know you are here, Rasika Bhaktas, relishing the different mellows, but Siddhanta is important for that to happen. No, I mean, if you take out Siddhanta, sentimentalism is only emotion, mundane emotionality is, is there. So Siddhanta is, is not an obstacle to Rasa, but it's actually a facilitator and establishing the foundation for the temple of Braja Bhakti we want to erect in our hearts. No? So, so that's a brief summary. Not so brief. <laughs> I did my best. 30 classes. <clears throat> so today we will be seeing verse 28. Before going to the verse, I generally, what I do is make a brief summary of the previous verse. Because every verse has some sort of connection with the next one. So I will briefly mention the previous verse. And then we will go to, to today's verse that we have here in the whiteboard as well. So verse 27 that we saw some days ago. <clears throat> I will read it in English directly, briefly, and mention a few words, and then we go to today's verse. So Brahma is saying, how sounding is the ignorance of ignorant people who consider you, who are their very self, to be some separated manifestation of illusion, and who consider the self to be something else, the material body, and who therefore conclude that the self is to be searched outside of your Supreme Personality. So in this verse, Brahma is using this Sanskrit term, Aho. Hmm? Aho. Aho. There are many verses like this. Hmm? Aho, Bhagyam, Aho, Bhagyam, Stanagala, Kultam, and so many others. No? So Aho means like surprise. Oh, not like, wow, alas, or whatever, depending on the context. So here is so Brahma is expressing a particular type of, of surprise or astonishment. He already passed his original bimohan or bewilderment, but in his prayer he will express another form of bewilderment, if you will. So he's surprised here oh, about those who do not understand the difference between the atma and the body, or those who consider Krishna as an atma. There may be people who know what's the difference between body and atma, but who might think, oh, Krishna is one of us. He's not who he is. And remember, Brahma just think, felt like this a few minutes ago. So here it seems that Brahma is condemning other people, but actually he's <laughs> expressing his own repentance hmm, and conversion. So, so in that sense, he's basically, he's create, founding, preparing the foundation for establishing Krishna's Purna Brahma. Mm -hmm. he will say Purna Brahma Sanatana Krishna is the complete form of the absolute 
So for that, he's also in some of these verses showing how the Nirvishesh Brahman, the impersonal feature of the Absolute, is, is not the complete picture, if you will. So when he seems to be criticizing Advaita Bhat, he's mostly doing so for establishing Krishna is the absolute face of Brahman. Every time the Upanishads speak about Brahman, we go to say they're speaking about Krishna. Because Krishna is Brahman in its ultimate future. Speaking too quickly, so then, sorry. That's Padmanava Maharaj. You already know me, so. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll try to. It's difficult sometimes because some ideas come and you kind of like, uh, please stop, wait for a minute there. <laughs> but I'll try my best. <clears throat> and Brahma says, I'm so I'm surprised not only because of the ignorance of such people, because also be, especially because many of that people think themselves they're very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. So they consider we know a lot, but at the same time, they don't know you. And again, Brahma is implying, I was one of them five minutes ago. And I may be still one of them. I'm starting to awaken to your to who you are now. Hmm? So first he's saying this Aho, no? which is the first. In, in a few verses, he will say Aho, Bhagiyam, Aho. But he will say Aho two times in, in a few verses. But first he's saying one, one time Aho. <laughs> so first he's ex expressing like astonishment when seeing how, how ignorant we can be. <laughs> and then he will express astonishment two times about how brilliant future we have. So we were speaking when we when I explained this verse some days ago. We were saying sometimes before realizing our brightest potential and say a whole <laughs> to that, <laughs> sometimes it helps us to realize our darkest potential. <laughs> to be shocked. About. Yeah, to be shocked how, how low we can fall. And like say, oh. <laughs> no? And indirectly, by realizing how low we can fall, indirectly that's showing us how high you can go. If you just use that energy in the proper direction, wow, aho, 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 bagyam, aho, how fortunate we can be. Hmm? So Brahma is basically saying this here. I'm surprised that people is looking for themselves or for God outside of your lotus feet. Remember, Brahma is seeing Krishna's lotus feet at this precise moment. So he's pointing at his feet with his finger, the commentator said, and say, how can people look for anything outside of those two feet? <laughs> he's realizing the value of Krishna's feet. In Braj, now those two feet are in Braj. He refers to that those to those two feet, not Mathura Krishna, not Dwarka Krishna, but Braja Krishna. Hmm? Hmm. So, so basically, Brahma here is expressing his bhava for Vrindavan and start to come more and more. So he starts to express himself in a way that may seem even like fanatical, hmm. because Brahma is saying, whoever is looking for Krishna outside of Braj, that's ignorance. <laughs> It's like, whoa, <laughs> well, sounds like fanatical. But sometimes when devotees are have lots of bhav, they will say these type of things mm -hmm. out of bhav, mm -hmm. not because they are fanatical. No. Like Prabhupada Saraswati in Chaitanya Chandramrita. <laughs> he really sounds like a fanatical at moments. For a fanatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he will say, considering what Mahaprabhu came to give to the world, who cares for what Baraha came to give? Who cares for Nesrim Madeya? Who cares for all these avatars? Now Mahaprabhu has come. He's ringing. So you have to understand the things because if you just imitate that, you commit Das Avatar Aparad. <laughs> <laughs> but he's saying that out of Bhav, our particular feeling. So here Brahma is saying something like that. Out of Braja Bhav, he's saying, whoever is looking for Krishna outside of Braj, they're in ignorance. <laughs> so basically, some words regarding that verse. No? So today we will go again to verse 28, which is the last verse of this section. Uh, can you? We, we should put that closer. You can see. We, I'll, I'll recite the verse once myself, if you will, in Sanskrit, and then you can. We can recite it all together. Hmm? 
So this verse is in Upajati Chanda, which is a particular meter. Different verses are in different meters in the Brahma Stuti. So this is verse 28. It says like this. Antar bhavi nantava bhamta meva hyatatya janta mrigayanti santa asanta mapyantya himantarena santam gunam tamki mujanti santa. So we can repeat all, maybe slower. Antar bhavi nantava bhamta meva hyatatya janta mrigayanti santa. Asanta mapyantya himantarena santam gunam tam kimoyanti santaha. Okay. You can rest now. <laughs> so I'll, I'll briefly share with you the English translator translation and then we can go a little bit word by word and then some commentaries on this verse. So the translation says. O oh, unlimited Lord, Brahma is speaking, the sadhus seek you out within their own bodies by rejecting everything separate from you. Indeed, do people who have common sense reach for a rope without making sure that it is not a snake? So that's today's verse. There's lots to unpack there. So let's go first to the word by word. Uh, I may recite and maybe you can repeat after me if it's possible. Mm -hmm. The Sanskrit and the translation. So antabhavi within the body. Within the body. Ananta. Ananta. O infinite one. O infinite one. <clears throat> Bhavantam. Bhavantam. You. You. Eva, Eva, only, only. He, he, certainly, certainly. Atat, Atat, everything separate from you, everything separate from you. Tyajantaha, Tyajantaha, while rejecting, while rejecting. Mrigayanti, search out. Santaha, Santaha, the sadhus, Asantamapi, Asantamapi, although not existing, although not existing, Anti, Anti nearby, nearby, Ahim, Ahim, this the snake, the snake, Antarena, Antarena, without. Without. Santam, Santam. Real. Real. real, gunam tam, gunam tam. To, the rope. to the rope, kimu, kimu. weather, weather. Yanti. yanti, appreciate, appreciate. Santaha. santaha, the righteous. The righteous. Okay, so what I've been doing this in this series of lectures for those who have not heard them, I'm sharing the different commentaries of our main acharyas, summary of them and things that sometimes they repeat the same thing, so I do not repeat them over, always. But I'm beginning by sharing uh, a commentary that my Guru Maharaj has written on the Brahma Stuti that will be publishing his forthcoming book on Sakya Rasa. This will be in there. That will be there. So this is a trailer of that as well. Yeah, when I when I wrote to my Guru Maharaj and I asked him if he will, I thought that I'd share with him. I had this idea of speaking Brahma Stuti, which was his opinion. He, he will give me blessings and so on. And he said yes. And he told me, oh, by the way, I've written a commentary on the Brahma Stuti. And I say, well, where? Because I read all your books. It's not there. It's in my forthcoming book. And I say, okay, so... What, what does it mean then that you are sharing that with me? That if you want, I can give the commentary so you can include that. So I say, okay, thank you so much. So <laughs> he has been very generous. And <clears throat> so I'm beginning with that, sharing some words that he wrote on the verse. And then we go to other commentators like Sridhar Swami, Sanatan Goswami, Jiva Goswami, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, and so on. So fasten your seatbelt.
<laughs> we are about to. We are already there some, some while ago. So it says like this. I'll begin with my Gurmash commentary called Bhaktivedanta Bhava Nubad. He says, <clears throat> of course, he's writing all this one after the other. So he's mentioning something here in connection to the previous verse. So in the previous verse, remember, Brahma was speaking about those ignorant who were looking for Krishna outside of Raj. So then he says, however, sadhus seek Krishna both within and without, for he is unbounded. He is ananta. He's everywhere. So sadhus look for Krishna everywhere. They also distinguish the reality of the Atma and Paramatma from Maya solution. They separate these different tattvas, rejecting that which is unreal. Brahma gives an example to illustrate his point concerning this their rejection. And the example is just as a person when reaching for a rope, first make sure that it is not a snake. Similarly, rejecting the unreal is required in order to embrace that which is real. You follow? Mm -hmm. okay. Fixing the mind on Krishna does not happen without rejecting illusory material life. Nor does attaining Krishna in Braj happen without rejecting the effort-based external paths of yoga and jnana. Should I repeat? <laughs> I, know, I know it can be difficult. I always translate my Guru Mahesh into Spanish and he speaks quick, quite quickly. <laughs> Fixing the mind on Krishna does not happen without rejecting illusory material life. And attaining Krishna in Braj does not happen. Attaining Krishna in Braj does not happen without, reje without rejecting the effort-based external paths of Gyan and Yoga. These are not paths of grace, but more based on one's effort. It doesn't mean that you don't have to make effort as a bhakta. No, that's another thing. <laughs> Okay. Without rejecting, Joe, I, I will of course explain this during the class. No, but if we want to attain Krishna in Braj, we have to attain him through bhakti, not through gyan, not through yoga, not through this type of sadhanas, which correspond with another type of goals in transcendence. If you want Krishna in Braj, <laughs> you have to ascertain what's the sadhana for that sadhya for that goal. One last paragraph. By emphasizing the realness of the Atma <clears throat> and distinguishing it from the illusion created by Maya on one hand and by distinguishing the Atma from being absolutely, absolutely identical with God on the other hand, Brahma also calls for the rejection of Vibhartabhat which is the, the impersonal path. So Brahma here is making the point, you want to take Krishna in Braj, you have to reject Gyan, Yoga, the impersonal conception. We will explain in which sense to reject. No, we are not reject people that goes in life like, oh, I reject you, you are wrong. <laughs> but in order to take Krishna in Braj, we have to embrace a particular, not only Bhakti, but a particular conception of Bhakti. Jnana, karma, adi, and avritam. So, <laughs> a conception of bhakti that is free from all separate endeavors apart from giving pleasure to Krishna, which is the Brajabasi's standard. And Brahma is, Brahma wants to be a Brajabasi. <laughs> so, he's realizing all that it requires, all that it takes. Okay, so let's go to some of the ancient commentaries of the Bhagavatam. If you need that I repeat something or, or, or if the translate, translator needs some break or some glass of water or something. <laughs> A second one. If you need time for that, you, you let me know. No problem. 
So let's begin with Sridhar Swami's Bhavartha Deepika, his famous ancient commentary on the Bhagavatam that Mahaprabhu revered so much and our Goswamis as well. So most of the commentators are like paraphrasing Brahma. Like they're speak, like repeating what like, with 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 different. I mean, they're adding their own insights while speaking as if there were Brahma will be speaking there, like sharing the implications of the verse, reading in between the lines. <clears throat> so, Brahma says through Sridhar Swami, <laughs> "Your sadhus, Brahma is speaking to Krishna. Your sadhus are rejecting." that which is not you. Of course, now we will see what the question is, what is not Krishna? <laughs> In other words, they are repudiating inertness or jadatva, or the idea that something basically is, that Krishna is not present in anything. They are rejecting that idea. Why, Sridhar Swami asks, Without rejecting what was wrongly superimposed, with, I, I repeat, without rejecting those things that were wrongly superimposed, the truth about the foundation of reality is not understood. No. So if you have a, a, a misunderstanding of reality, you cannot understand reality, basically. Like you have to deconstruct some wrong idea before you can start. Like if you never play, never learned harmonium by from anyone, but you created your own idea about what what's the meaning of playing harmonium, and you play as you think it's correct, and then you go to a teacher first class, and he say, and you go with there's a story of that, and there you go with a friend who never played harmonium. Uh, you have been playing harmonium for 10 years, but according to your own idea. Mm -hmm. So the teacher says, okay, you are taking first class from scratch. You are starting from zero, so I'll charge you, I don't know, five francs a class. Too expensive in Switzerland? Yeah. yeah? yeah. Cheap. <laughs> okay. So it's good. For the example, it's good. Five francs first class of harmonium. And the other one say, okay, and I'm practicing for the last 10 years. Okay, you will pay 25 francs per class. And the other person say, but why? I'm much more advanced. I say, no, no, but, but you never took any class. So first I have to help you deconstruct all the things you think is correct. And then we have to start from zero. <laughs> So you have to pay more. <laughs> so this is something like that. No? We are carrying some mis misconceptions about the absolute, and you cannot approach the absolute before having those things in place. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is our neti neti as Gaudias, if you will. Neti neti means this is not, this is not, this is not. No, it's not the neti neti of impersonalists who will say this is not Brahman, this is not Brahman, only Brahman is real. We will just say no, no, no to the wrong understanding of reality. Mm -hmm. That's what we, when we say we have to reject some things. It's not to reject people, to reject, everything is, is Krishna and an energy of Krishna, so there's nothing to reject. The only thing we reject is the wrong understanding of those things. You follow my point. If you have proper understanding of everything, there's nothing to reject. <laughs> it's, everything is to be embraced in Seva. Because everything is the Shakti of Bhagavan. So we don't need to reject anything. But in the beginning, we don't have that vision. So we need to reject the wrong vision we may have <laughs> that makes us see the world as, oh, this is for my enjoyment. I am the center and everything revolves around me, you have to reject those lands, if you will. Mm -hmm. That's what we call pratikulyasya bharjanam, one of the six limbs of saranagati. You have to reject something which is not favorable for bhakti. So what's unfavorable for bhakti? It's not people or things, but it's the way you are filtering people and things. <laughs> 
to follow. Because sometimes in the beginning, one practitioner may think, whatever, oh, that's bad, be careful, that's, that person is wrong, and you create these false enemies outside. But in time, you realize I'm my only worst enemy. There are no enemies outside. So I have to become friends with myself. <laughs> and there, is, there are no more enemies. And everything favorable in Krishna service. Mm -hmm. So as we were speaking these days with Krishna Chandra, we have to have a positive orientation to our practice. Not so much about rejecting and not doing things. And this is, but the only thing to reject is the wrong understanding of things. That's why it's so important study. We were speaking today in the morning. We have to study. No, Shastra, no, not, not just to entertain the, the brain, <laughs> but by receiving proper knowledge, we educate our understanding of reality and we will act according to that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Sambanda Abhideya, Prayojan. Prayojan is the goal to attain, but for attaining a goal, you have to behave in a certain way. But for behaving in a certain way, first you have to understand who is who and what is what. If you have, I don't have a clue who I am, <laughs> what's the world, my actions will be disastrous, basically. It won't take to prayogen, to that prayogen. So sambanda means, interestingly, sambanda. Sam means everything, and banda means bonded. So sambanda gyan, gyan means knowledge. That's our gyan as bhaktas. Sambanda gyan means the knowledge that shows some banda, how some, everything is banda, is connected with Krishna. <laughs> so when we receive that knowledge and we start to see everything is connected with Krishna, we will behave accordingly. If I now educate that everything is connected with Krishna, Krishna is the center of everything, including myself. He's my center. I will act in a certain way in my life. I will move in a certain way. And that will take me, take me to a certain goal. So in that sense, Prayojan and Sambanda are synonymous. <laughs> if you have proper Sambanda, you will have proper Prayojan because you will, Abhideya will be in place. So again, here it is said, the sadhus reject that which is not Krishna. So, but Krishna is everything. <laughs> Where Krishna is not, he's everywhere. He's all pervading. He's infinite. In one sense, everything is Krishna. Everything is an, an, an aspect of his energies. There's nothing separate from him. So when, it, when we say sadhus reject what is not Krishna, refers sadhus reject, again, this mentality that shows me something that is disconnected from Krishna. That's what we call maya, basically. To be under the influence of Maya Shakti means to see something disconnected from Krishna. That's all. That, that's, I mean, Maya Shakti is real. It's a Shakti of Bhagavan. But what, what you see through the effect of Maya Shakti, that's not real. <laughs> that's illusion, basically. Because you stop seeing Krishna. And you start seeing you in the center of reality. So that's dementia, basically. <laughs> and everything revolves around me. And the problem is the next person next to me thinking the same. And this next person next to me, I am the center. And I am the center. I am the center. And none of them is the center. <laughs> so, so that's what sadhus reject. Again, sadhus are not about are people that like to reject. They only reject that which is not reality, that which is not Krishna. But when you have proper sambanda gyan, there's nothing to reject. The only concern is how can I engage this in Krishna's service? How can I serve? So, <clears throat> anyhow, that, that, that's the idea. No? That's sambanda gyan. The conclusion is everything is a shakti of Bhagavan. Everything, any single atom, every single species, whatever you can possibly perceive, is a shakti of shakti mam. One name of Krishna is Shakti Mam, energetic source. So everything is a Shakti, an energy of the energetic source. We are a Shakti of the energetic source. So the only question is how we engage all the energies for the pleasure of the energetic source. That's the only question we have to make. Shakti Mam. Man, man, like man in, in English. 
der Ursprung aller Kraft. So everything is the Shakti of Shakti Man. Sorry if I'm torturing you with many new technical terms. <laughs> But you are saying you are taking notes, so you are very good students, very nice. <laughs> so that's Sambandha Gyan in, in very short period. No? Everything is Shakti. There is Shakti and Shakti Man, the energetic source and the energies. They are inseparable from themselves. So that which is unreal is to see a separation be between that which is inseparable. And Maya Shakti creates that effect. We do not connect the dots. We do not see each other as having a common source. And that creates conflict and all that, I mean, story of human civilization. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a sadhu is rejecting that, basically. But is accepting. In other, when we say sadhu is reje rejecting that, actually we are saying sadhu is accepting. When we say rejecting, that's only one part of the equation. The main part is sadhus are accepting this idea. Everything is a Shakti of Bhagavan and exists for the pleasure of, of, the, of, of the source. So that's our life. You know? How can I serve? That's the, the, the conclusion of a kinkar. A kinkar means servant. Hmm? Mahaprabhu says, Ainanda Tanuya Kinkaram. And very nice the word kinkar. Kinkar means servant. But etymologically, you have the two parts here. Kim, karomi. Kim means what? And karomi means do, to do. So kim karomi is what I can do. Or in other words, to say, how can I serve you? And that's the word servant, kim karomi. Like, like, that's the only question a servant has. Hmm? Once Srila Prabhupada say that, the disciple has only one question to his guru. How can I serve you? I mean, we can make many questions. But all those questions are in the context of this, only this question. <laughs> so yesterday we were speaking about the role of the student and the disciple and the question. So all of them come from this side. How can I serve you? How can I give you pleasure? Anyhow, let's continue. <laughs> you have some more time? How is the translator going on there? Oh, he's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> You already have gone through three translators in one same class, so <laughs> they are coming on one after another. Bimohan. <laughs> one head is was spinning already. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We have to enter into the Bimohan mood. So. <laughs> Not only Brahma is Bimohan here. Everyone is Bimohan. <laughs> Krishna is Vimohan by Radha's love. Everyone is Vimohan. So no, it's okay, no problem. <laughs> so let's share some words regarding Sanatan Goswami's commentary. His Brihad Vaishnav Toshani. <clears throat> so, similar ideas. Brahma will say through Sanatan Goswami The sadhus attain you. By negating any wrong idea about the nature of Ishvara and by, by stop thinking, sorry, but I am um, by thinking, they attain you by thinking, I am not he, Ishvara, but I belong to him. That's another way to establish Sambanda. And what means Sambanda? I am not Ishvara, I'm not God, I belong to God. That's some someone also translates sometimes as relationship. What's my relationship with him? I'm yours. Tabasmi. Tabai was me, Tabai was me. I'm yours. I belong to you, and therefore you belong to me. <laughs> That's the mamata that comes eventually. Mamata means possessiveness. So there's always some healthy possessiveness in, in, in love. We belong to each other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is right from the very beginning in, in our practice another limb of Sharanagati I say Pratikulyasya Varjanam but also they have Goptritui Varanam which means Krishna is my maintainer mm -hmm. that's a very very nice meditation to think I'm being maintained by Krishna his support, he's maintaining me in every sense of the term, not only financially biologically <laughs> psychologically, but from tip to toe, in my heart of heart, I mean sustained, nourished, 
protected by him. I belong to him. I surrender to him. Hmm? So possessiveness is, is the source of all problems in this world. Mm -hmm. I mean mine. But possessiveness is the solution to all the problems in this world. <laughs> when you direct that to Krishna. Without Krishna in the equation, you start to think, I, me, mine. So I have things that belong to me. And uh, I develop an identity on the basis of what belongs to me. <laughs> but the problem is nothing belongs to me. <laughs> but you de we develop sometimes an identity. This is mine, therefore I am this. No? This is my wife, I am a husband. This is my son, I am a father. You follow? This, is, this belongs to me. And I am this. But what if I tell you nothing belongs to you? So who you are? <laughs> Without anything to possess. Huh? Existential crisis. <laughs> so the real question is not so much what belongs to me, but who I belong to. Then your real identity will, will come. <laughs> Once one devotee went to visit Sri Bhakti Rakshak Siddhar Maharaj for the first time, to have darshan in in, in, in Sri Chaitanya Saraswat Math in Koladweep. So he entered his room for the first time. Try to imagine meeting someone like Srila Siddhar Maharaj for the first time in your life, and probably the last time in your life. <laughs> so he falls at his feet and offers pranam. And Srila Siddhar Maharaj immediately asks <laughs> something. He says, What's yours? <laughs> Nothing. Good morning. What's your name? How are you doing? What's yours? <laughs> so you can imagine this devotee was young and like nervous. I'm going to see this great person. And suddenly he's asking me that out of the blue. I don't know what to say, what I'm supposed to re reply to this question. Or like when your guru is asking you something and you wonder what I'm supposed to say. What's the correct answer to this? <laughs> so the devotee was like, Bimohan. <laughs> <laughs> Bewildered. So the kid, he couldn't speak. He was like, so Sia Samaras could perceive that. Who he said, close your eyes. No? <laughs> he said that to the boat, close your eyes. So the boat closed his eyes. So he was like, so Sia Samaras said, what do you see? He said, nothing. Sia Samaras said, Open your eyes. Okay, no, no. That's yours. <laughs> <laughs> because remember, he asked him, what's yours? Mm -hmm. He said, no, close your eyes. I see nothing. That's yours. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the the preliminary qualification to have darshan of someone like Sula Siddhar Maharaj, to understand that. Because if not, you won't understand all the other things that he had to say. <laughs> so that's an important thing. No? <clears throat> So, but again, if we think in terms of I belong to Krishna and the, the relationship develops, we will conclude he belongs to me as well. This is the mamata, the possessiveness that will save us from the other possessiveness, the material one that is the source of all entanglement. Bhakti Notagra say, what's samsara? Huh? What's samsara? What do, will you say? Someone asks you, what's samsara? How do you de define the word samsara? Nandini. What's samsara? Mm, yeah. That's a good way. Yeah, yeah. Like sometimes we say repeated cycle of birth and death. And Bhakti Thakur, when he was asked what samsara, he said, which basically is that. It means I, me, mine. That's what activates the whole circuit, the whole samsara. Coming and going. <laughs> Anyhow, let's continue. Sanatan Goswami says another option, another purpose to this verse is the word atat in this verse, the second line you can see, can mean also, which means what is not that, or what is not Krishna. Atat can mean also impersonal trance. In other words, 
Brahm is rejecting that here. Without rejecting the opposite of a real thing, real thing is not obtained. Again, this point was mentioned already. You want something real? First, you have to reject the false idea of that real thing. So sometimes we have these two approaches. No, We say what something is and what something is not. So it is comprehensive. No? Smart avyasa tatam vishnur vishmart avyana jatuchit. No? On one side, always remember Vishnu or God or Krishna. And then it says, never forget him. Yeah. <laughs> and you may say, but, but that's already included in always remember him. <laughs> yes, but probably you need to hear the second part also because you may not understand the implications of the first part. So always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. Never forget means always remember. Always remember means never forget. <laughs> But sometimes we need the two sides of the coin to, okay, I understand what this is and what this is not. Mm -hmm. There are many verses in Shastra in this way, very didactic. Okay, learn like this, learn like this also, and so on. So here it's similar. This is real, what is to accept, and this is the unreal thing which is not to be accepted. Mm -hmm. And Sanatan Goswami presents an argument to his own point. The Goswamis are very expert in doing that to make a very comprehensive thing. They are not just dogmatic people. This is the truth, no more questions, end of the conversation. Even if... We... Drink, drink, no problem. Okay. So even if someone, before someone has an argument to, to the Goswami, they themselves will present arguments to their own point. And their arguments are way more better than any of the opposition party, if you will. <laughs> So they themselves want to make their points very comprehensive and, and, and solve anything in the way. So Sanatan Goswami says, an argument may be presented here. No? If someone say, why to, to speak about rejecting the, the unreal? Just automatically by remembering Bhagavan, everything else will come. Something like this, no? And Sanatana Goswami says, no, Brahma replies to that by quoting here the example of the snake and, this ro and the rope. The idea is, remembering Bhagavan does not properly happen, properly, without completely rejecting uh, material sense objects. Nor it happens without completely rejecting karma, jnana, and so forth. Again, rejecting sense objects doesn't mean oh this is a sense object rejected i reject the wrong approach to the sense object and suddenly this becomes udipana <laughs> it's not the source of entanglement but it's oh it's a stimulant for bhakti if you see a cartel you will see like oh kirtan <laughs> this is a famous famous Lila and how we can train our vision in that sense. It is said that two friends were walking and a crow flies on the sky. Okay. And one and the one devotee starts to say, Haribo, 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 like celebrate. And the other friends like, Why you are you celebrating a crow? You know? A crow generally is more connected with death. You know, he goes where no? Some corpses, like corpses are there and he's more connected with this dark side. <laughs> so where are you saying, hurry bo, hurry bo? <laughs> and they would say, because every time I see a crow, my mind goes to the crematory, crematorium, mm -hmm. where all these corpses are there. But also in the crematorium, the cows who die naturally mm -hmm. will be there. And with the skin of those cows, we will make the heads of the mridangas. And through with those mridangas, we will engage in Hari Kirtan. So Hari Bo. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about how you choose to, to, to read reality. You can see, oh, a crow, I don't like that. Or Hari Bo. Every, next time you see a crow, you already know where, where to go. <laughs> of course, we have to be trained to think in those terms. You follow? No. This devotee was seeing a crow and he ended up in Harikirtan. And we may be seeing Harikirtan and we may be going to a crow. 
<laughs> if you don't have properly training vision, you may be in front of something officially devotional, <laughs> but your mind goes to something ordinary. <laughs> but when you are very advanced, even in the most ordinary situation, you connect that with Krishna somehow because everything is connected with Krishna. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we are saying here, rejecting. <laughs> rejecting the wrong reading of reality. <laughs> okay. We have some minutes? Sure. Today I'm extending just, a little bit just, more because just, we have this. <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Today we had this summary in the beginning, also making a little bit extra, but let's go to Jiva Goswami's commentary now. As long as the translator is still alive, we are okay. <laughs> That's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another glass of I have one glass of water just in case here. Yeah. I'm not touching it. That's reserved for the translator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jiva Goswami is paraphrasing Brahma, saying, O per pervader of all, People of good judgment seek only you within the world. No? So a sadhu means people of good judgment. They are seeking you in the world. It's not that you need to seek God somewhere else. He's everywhere. And the world, you can start right here with whatever is close. According to these people who have proper discernment, the world is an effect of you. No? It's a result of your one of your energies. So the world contains traces of your qualities. No? Somehow the world is an effect and you are the cause. So generally in, in the effect you find some elements that are in the cause. So you can find traces of Krishna, if you will, in this world, which is an effect of he who is the cause of all causes. Mm -hmm. So here Jiva Goswami is speaking about those sadhus who are Seeing Krishna everywhere, even in this world, again. They are not world deniers. No? As we spoke yesterday, no? in, in the beginning we are more concerned, I want to leave this world, I want to transcend samsara. But when you advance more and more, I mean, Vrindavan is a state of consciousness, in one sense. So if you reach that state of consciousness, you reach Vrindavan. It's not you, you are not concerned. I have to leave this world as soon as possible because you are no longer in that in that conception. Jiva hmm. Goswami hmm. mean, concludes this section interestingly. He said he's speaking about high sadhus. So he said, in fact, such sadhus don't care to determine what is real and what is unreal. They sh take shelter in you, and they get that shelter. Hmm. So he's speaking more about here those very high sadhus who are not even in need to discern too much because they are already seeing you everywhere. So they are there. Then Sri Lajiva Goswami will start to contrast this with other schools of thought, like jnanis, yogis, and by this contrast establishing furthermore the supremacy of, of Krishna. <clears throat> of bhakti, Krishna bhakti. And also he will say, higher than realization of Brahman is antaryami, higher than antaryami. And he will present like sequence, concluding in Krishna's two Bhagavan, which is Brahma's insight here. <clears throat> so we may wonder why our acharyas are pounding so much this post of differentiating between Bhakti and Gyan. Sometimes our church speaks strongly about Advaita Vat, very strongly. <laughs> Some of them are specialists, and even if the topic is not speaking about that, they they, they find an excuse to start to smash Vibhartha Vat strongly. <laughs> but one of the things is because they consider the form of Krishna uh, as an upadi, as a false designation. Not as real, not as eternal. A follower of Sankaracharya will, will consider only Brahman is real. Even Krishna, that's 
an up I won't I don't want to take use too many technical terms, but they would say that's an upadi on Brahman. So that's a temporary designation. So of course for us for Brahma, no Brahman, Brahma, he's just discovering the form of Krishna is the source of everything. So imagine if at that point someone comes and says form of Krishna is temporary and illusory. I don't know how Brahma will react to that person. <laughs> he will. <laughs> so that's why he and our chairs are making this point. The form of Krishna is not only real and eternal, but is the source of all other forms. And again, this is not an easy idea to digest because the form of Krishna seems limited, seems small, seems ordinary. Brahma was very confused a few minutes ago. <laughs> he thought, this boy is an imposter. <laughs> so if Brahma gets confused, many other people may be also confused with the Nara Lila. God behaving like a human, that's not easy to digest. So that's why our Acharyas insist so much on these, these different points. For us to understand, this Nara Lila is not ordinary, it's not a joke, it's super extraordinary. It's called Aprakrita. Aprakrita means seems it seems prakrita, it seems ordinary, but it's super extraordinary. It doesn't seem extraordinary at the first sight. No? If you go to a place like Baikuntha, that seems extraordinary. Everyone has two more arms. <laughs> Imagine you enter a place, everyone appears with four arms. You say, like, where I am? I mean, I'm in some extraordinary place you know, people with extra arms extra heads <laughs> extra extra that's overtly transcendental you are aware i'm in an extraordinary place you go to vrindavan and seems what's this i'm back on earth now this is normal this looked like uncivilized village people nothing extraordinary here mm, look closely pay more attention and you will end up end up like brahma this is super extraordinary. This is way beyond by concept. How they are treating God is like wow. <laughs> when Udava went to Brunei, he was like that. He he tried to bring some Aishwari into the picture, telling Jashod and Nanda, Oh, you are so fortunate. You love God as a child. But he said, you love God. No? Krishna is God, but you love him like your children. You are so fortunate. Ananda Maharaj is looking at Udav like a madman. I say like, Udav, Udav, I heard that you were a very wise person, learned person. This reputation reached my ears. But now that you say this, I realize that you don't understand anything. You are saying that Krishna is God. You must be joking. I know there's like, what's going on here? <laughs> he just arrived to Vrindavan first time. So he's discovering Brajabhav here. I mean, Krishna is God. The scriptures clearly say that this all throughout the Vedas. And Nanda Mara said, I know God. I worship God every day. I have him in my altar. Narayan is there. Narayan. I do puja to Narayan. Nanda Mara practices by Divakti. In Golok Vrindavan. <laughs> he worships Narayan following all rules and regulations very nicely. Although his mind is somewhere else. His mind is with Krishna always. <laughs> He's not very good in Vaidhi Bhakti. <laughs> <laughs> his mind is <laughs> sleeping there. But externally, formally, he's following like... In the in the land of Raga, Ragatnikas, he's following Vaidhi. <laughs> That's interesting. So Nanda says, Uddhav, you say that Krishna is God. I know God. I worship him daily. He's self-satisfied. He's Shanti Purush. He's the personification of peace. No, not I. But Krishna is exactly the opposite. He's, yeah. he's not at peace at all. He's full of desires. He's always asking me things. If I'm not doing, giving him what he asks, he starts to cry. He's doing so much mischief. Ananda Maharaj is not aware of his mischief with the gopis. No. <laughs> So he's, <laughs> he's whimsical, mischievous, he's a liar, he's a thief. And God is the opposite of that. He cannot be God. That's his Siddhanta. And Anuda is like, wow, what's he? 
So anyhow, my point with this is Nara Lila is not easy to understand. No? We have been fortunate enough and we have been introduced with that by the sadhus and we kind of have a feeling for that. But also we have to be careful not to take the Braja Lila for granted and see that, get accustomed to that as an ordinary thing. So. Okay, let's conclude with Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary, his Sarartha Darshini, which will give kind of a summary to the whole verse. So it's a way of also making full circle before concluding. He paraphrases Brahma. He said, Brahma prayed. The Gyanis think that your form is an attribute of Maya. Again, what I just said. Your saintly devotees, however, seek out the pure form of the living entity free from the covering of Maya. By rejecting that which is material, they seek out the jiva which takes birth among countless species in various bodies. To reject everything material, one must first reject the false conception that I am the material body. That's a good point. To reject everything material means to reject my false identification as material. The more you understand you are not material, the more you stop, the more you have, the, the more you, the less you need to reject things. The more you, you understand I'm not material, the more you start to see everything in connection to who you are and all that you can be. And Brahma concludes. <clears throat> How can one appreciate the real nature of a rope lying before him until he refutes the illusion that it is a snake? Oh, he goes to the example. In the Vedas it is said, Asangohiya yam purushaha, famous Vedic dictum, which means the soul has nothing to do with the body. They are like oil and water. They do not mix, although we may think so. We may be thinking, I am, but actually who you actually are, you cannot even touch matter. We may think I'm touching it. The Atma is not touching matter. You are thinking you are touching matter, but the identification with you as matter by the influence of Maya Shakti. Therefore, the Jiva has no bodily suffering. Mm. So what we experience as suffering, that's not touching the soul. Exactly. Yeah, some verses before he mentioned this idea, yeah. I mean, the, the Atma in itself, that's another long topic. But he will say, Maya can never touch the Atma, can never affect the Atma. So in one sense, the Atma is beyond Maya. Mm. So we, as, as who we are, as Atmas, are transcendental to Maya. But we are unaware of who we are. <laughs> and, and we think we are <laughs> affected by Maya. But actually the Atma is not touched by Maya at any moment. And Brahma gave one example before. He said, as in, if you are in the sun... There's no day and there's no night in the sun. We say here there is day and night because we are not in the sun. But if you are in the sun, there is no night. And if there is no night, there is no day. Because day is just the opposite of the night. But if there is no night, there is no day. <laughs> there is sun. So he will say, from the perspective of the Atma, there is no bondage nor liberation. The Atma is beyond both. <laughs> Anyhow. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur concludes saying, due to ignorance, the jiva identifies with its body and thus experiences various miseries. So due to...
Abhidya to the Sadhma Shakti. Without rejecting everything related to the body, again, this false identification and conception, can one realize his spiritual identity just by cultivating transcendental knowledge, Gyan? No, Brahma says. One cannot know the soul without rejecting all attachments to the material body. So basically what we were saying, rejecting the false uh, reading of things. And let me conclude just with two lines from Srinivas Suri, who is another commentator of the Bhagavatam. He says something interesting, going back to the sadhus who have some banda gyan. Remember this knowledge that shows us how everything belongs to Krishna. So he said, the sadhus, <clears throat> those who have some banda gyan related to you. So it's nice. He, he defines sadhu, he who has or she who has some banda gyan. That's one way you can reply. Who is a sadhu? That person who has some banda gyan. <laughs> because the sadhu behaves in a certain way and that behavior is guided by some banda gyan. So those sadhus who have some banda gyan, they seek you. No, they are seeking you. They are revering you, they are offering pranam to you in their bodies while repudi repudiating the world, including the gods, like rejecting, repudiating, like rejecting, including the gods. So that's that's like more of an, uh, going back to what we say in the beginning when Brahma seemed to seem like a fanatical, saying like, uh, whoever looks for you outside of brush, they're in ignorance. So here's Srinivas stories. Your sadhus, re, re, those who really are at your feet, they're even rejecting the gods. <laughs> of course, this doesn't mean we will offend the devas. But there is place for these ecstatic expressions. There is a famous verse. We have to go again to our favorite gore fanatic, <laughs> Prabodhananda oh, Saraswati. In, in Chaitanya Chandramrita, I'll recite the verse so you drink water now, no problem. <laughs> He's saying, Kaivalyam Nara Kayate Trita Shapur Akasha Push Payate Durdan Tendriya Kala Sarpa Patalai Protkata Dams Jayate Vishwam Purnam Sukayate Vidhi Mahen Dradisha Kitayate Yat Karunya Kataksha by Bobotam Tam Gorami Vashuma. So he's saying, For someone who has received the slightest sidelong glance of mercy from Sri Gor Sundar, which seems insignificant, just very small sidelong glance, but from someone very significant from Sriman Mahaprabhu, <laughs> and then he comes a list of effects what happens when you receive that slide long say <laughs> the impersonal liberation becomes hellish the, the, the attainment of mukti is like hell for a devotee in comparison to the mercy of god the, the, the attainment of swarga lok becomes like a Akasha Pushpayati, like a flower in the sky, which is a way of saying in India, like a phantasmagoria, something impossible. You never see a flower in the sky. I mean, you can through one, but generally they are not. So it's something that is not happening. And many other things he say, I won't go into details of the verse. He will say, Bishpa Purnam Sukhayate, in relation to this, which means, Krishna the Gita say, Dukalayama Sashvata. <laughs> No, because he's speaking on to some audience. In the Gita, Krishna said, Dukalayama Sharshvatam. This world is full of misery. And we're like, oops. And someone may say, but but Krishna is such a great time enjoying in this world. I won the lottery last week and I'm traveling to Cancun and on the beach here and I'm having <laughs> such a great time. It's not full of misery for me. <laughs> At least not for me, one may say. And Krishna immediately says second word, Asashvatam. Asashvatam means? Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> basically, Asashvatam means that which does not endure. No? It's temporary. So no matter how great of a time you're having, it's over in, in, in 
Mm. So the more you get attached to the great time, the more you will suffer when it's over. You follow. I believe you're having a great time now. And I see that you are getting attached to that. So I believe that you ha will have a great headache in a few minutes when that's over. Because it's a beginning. You know, so Krishna is giving that perspective on the world on some level. Miserable and temporary. It's <laughs> like, oops. <laughs> but here, Prabhupada Saraswati is saying, means the world is full of joy. He's not saying it's miserable. Because, of course, Krishna is saying it's miserable if you want to exploit the world. If you are not seeing Krishna there, that's miserable and that's temporary. If you see the world with Krishna in the center, with the glance of Mahaprabhu there, that's an abode of joy because the only thing you find are service opportunities. Service opportunities. That's the only thing there is in this world. If you have proper vision, there are no, my Guru Master likes to say that, there are no problems. There are only service opportunities. Of course, it's easier said than done, but that's reality. You have just to adjust your perspective. <laughs> Once one devotee went to Srila Siddhar Maharaj and asked another devotee, not the one I told today, and asked, Guru Maharaj, can you give me some seva? And the devotee was very naive. <laughs> so he thought maybe Guru Maharaj will give me a broom or tell me wash the pots, clean the bathroom, something practical. And Srila Siddhar Maharaj <laughs> here, can you give me some service? Siddhar Maharaj said, Change your angle of vision. Yeah. <laughs> that was his that was his service. Imagine. That was his reply. Can you give me some service? Yeah, of course. I will give you service for eternity. Change your angle of vision. If you change your angle of vision, you will realize I don't need to ask for service because everything are service opportunities. <laughs> so <laughs> So here we have Prabhu Dananda Saraswati Thakur changing his angle of vision by the grace of Mahaprabhu and saying, the world is full of joy. No more misery. Nothing temporary. Everything is becomes eternal. Eternality explodes in this world. <laughs> huh? And then he will say, Vishwa Purnan Sukhayate, Vidhi Mahendra Discha Kitayate. He says, and devas, like Indra and others, are no better than insects. <laughs> so that's what I quoted this verse, because at one point, again, it's out of bath. We are not against devas or insulting anyone, but in comparison to those, those positions and the so-called enjoyment they are having, Indra is like a very, uh, a person who personifies material enjoyment in a very sophisticated way. But if you receive the grace of gore, that's no better to be an insect. Thank you so much. But I, I remain here. Kirtaniya <laughs> Sadahari. So anyhow, some words I want to share with you today about this, this particular verse. Uh, so today we are concluding this section of prayers. This is the last verse of a section of prayers. Um, from the next verse, from tomorrow on, almost till the end of Brahma Stuti, uh, we will turn to a very emotional section in which Brahma will start to express, as I say, his longing from, for Brajava more and more and more. And more. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So tomorrow we will start there, but today we will conclude here. Uh, I don't know if we have a few minutes, if anyone has a question. Sure. I mean, in the evening we will have questions, but maybe there can be some, any other be question. Some suppressed now. Some. Sorry? Some cannot be suppressed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. I was a bit confused, but maybe it's because I misunderstood the story from last night. Because, um, yeah, you said several times that uh, we don't have to reject people or objects, it's just the mm -hmm. way we see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I understood that uh, Lord Chaitanya, he. Mm, yeah, it was like a punishment for his mm. devotee. He said he won't have darshan for 100 million years. I understood lifetimes. a lifetime. Um, I understood that this was because he had sangha with other people. Mm -hmm. So he did not reject 
people. Mm -hmm. So what does so dilemma? Yeah, yeah, I understand the point. Well, kind of, of course, what Mahaprabhu did in this lila is according to the principle sometimes called asat sangha tyag e vaishnav achar, which means the, the behavior of the Vaishnav is characterized by avoiding asat sangha. Asat sangha means, I mean, you can translate very quickly as bad association. <laughs> But that's not the the real meaning. No? Sangha means association, but also means attachment. And asat means the opposite of sat. So it means unreal. So asat sangha means attachment to that which is not real. <laughs> so that's the thing to reject, as we were explaining today. No, the the behavior of the Vaishnav means to reject the unreal. It's, an, it's a way of putting that, of course. In, in, in positive terms, is to embrace the real and to be attached to that. And we progress by attachment, as, as called by Sangha. Sangha means association, but also means attachment. No? It's in, my Guru Master likes to make this point that in other paths, like yoga or gyan, one aspect of their sadhana is bairagya, which means renunciation. In Sankaracharya's line, you cannot attain mukti if you don't accept sannyas. Try to imagine how many candidates. <laughs> you want to attain the goal of our path, you all have to accept sannyas first. It's like, okay. Or in, in Patanjali's yoga, preliminary practice, Jamaniya, Ramacharya. Before sitting for asana. <laughs> but in bhakti, we don't have those preliminary requ requ requisites. You don't have to be no, keep it be prakibanyas, sutra kinina, and so on. Grihe taka, vani taka, sarahari boli taka. You can be at home and so on and attain perfect because bhakti is way more powerful than gyan and yoga. Hmm? Gyan and yoga require more qualification from us because those paths are not so qualified, so powerful. Bhakti is so powerful, you can remain at home, family working, and attain. Brindavan, and in Brindavan, you will be a a grihasta. <laughs> As I like to say, devotees sometimes who have too much of a bairagi orientation, I say, in Golok Brindan, there are no sannyasis there. <laughs> I mean, some sannyasi may come as a visit to the village or something. But <laughs> uh, So my point with this is uh, when Mahaprabhu says reject asat sangha, means re reject the unreal, the attachment to the unreal. And sometimes there is there are people who basically lead their lives according to those, to attachment to the unreal thing. So when he's saying reject those people, <laughs> he's not meaning hate them or whatever, but just in your present stage, you may be influenced by by that and that may affect your bhakti negatively so you may need to take some distance but in that distance you should remain respectful and to those people in the sense that they are still an atma or an atma is there so many extraordinary things that potential for bhakti is there <laughs> for example in the bhagavatam when it is a premium maitri kripa when the bhakti and bhakti is described an intermediate devotee say to, he loves Bhagavan, he, she, he has friendship with the devotees, he is compassionate towards the innocent, and he avoids the envious person. So avoids doesn't mean you are being like critic with that person. You just realize, oh, that person is envious. The more I get close to someone envious, the more envious they become, and the more they, the more they may engage in, in apparat. Hmm. So sometimes we take a distance so they do not be engage in apparat. So it's compassion. It's compassion. It takes a different form. We all we, because sometimes we think compassion is only this. <laughs> sometimes compassion. Bishwanath Chakravarti Thakur said the way to show compassion to an envious person is to take a distance from that person. 
in a, in in a spirit of service to that person, in the spirit of respecting the person from a distance. Because also sometimes we we may not be able to respect someone who is a mess <laughs> and is too close to us. We may get like distracted by their anarthas and end up just oh he's this he's that. So we may need the distance. So in the distance we can see something good and start to. Because the rule, Mahaprabhu say, "Amani na, manade na." You respect everyone, and you do not expect respect from anyone. So you have to apply that rule somehow. <laughs> so in order to respect some people, you need to take some distance. In other, in other cases, you may be closely intimate associate. In others, will be like. So, so, so this is the the way that we can harmonize this idea. No, it's not that Mahaprabhu is. In, instructing Mukunda or, or through Mukunda like reject that people no accept them respect them appreciate them but sometimes for that to happen <laughs> you need a this you need some distance you follow my point so so that's the idea no? we have to always remain respectful to everyone how that plays out we have to see in each case because also we can impact them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we shouldn't think we are that innocent and pure. Yeah, no, like I don't win. I don't want to be contaminated by all of you. So I take a distance. No, no. I I may be contaminating all of you. So watch out for me. Take a distance. Be careful. <laughs> yeah. We spoke about this aho. Mm. <laughs> And how Brahma is like having this astonishment about his own conditioning. And later is coming the words Aho Bhagyam, Aho Bhagyam, yeah. two times Aho. Mm -hmm. And this means much more astonishment. But maybe first time, the first step towards a sacred astonishment mm. is really to be shocked and a little worried, Aho astonished about the intensity and the denseness of my conditioning. Mm. So the normal reaction of persons, even devotees who look at this conditioning is mostly discouragement. Mm. I think it's hopeless. Mm. So can you connect this kind of looking towards the conditioning as a way of inspiration, which it is, mm. Mm. instead of discouragement? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, that's in part to what we spoke yesterday to, to your question, no? How to look at our condition in a way that creates gives hope and not over identification with our shadow, if you will. So so yeah, we have been speaking a lot with Krishna Chandra Prabhu these days about that, like the need for a, a, a greater positive orientation to our practice because bhakti is pretty positive oriented path it's not again about rejecting the world about leaving the world but it's about accepting everything integrating i like to use that word for transcendence because sometimes when we hear transcendence we may think in terms of rejecting i have to transcend this world no. means I have to reject the world. No. Transcendence means integration of things that I've not learned how to integrate yet. Integration of complexity, as we spoke the other day. <laughs> there are things that are complex, I have not integrated, and they create suffering. But I'm suffering because I've not learned to integrate those things in a proper way. And so... So the way to, to look at myself and at my own potential for darkness, if you will, <laughs> is not to, it's a delicate exercise, I know, because it's, I mean, it's internal, it's personal, and, and for many lifetimes, whatnot, we have been overly identified with that. Not only with material, physical body, with, with psychic dimension, we think I'm that. <laughs> so all the things start to appear and, and we think, oh my God, it's not easy to just dismiss, I'm not that, I'm Atma. No, it may be difficult. Uh, but it's important that every time that we adventure ourselves to, to look at 
the potential for darkness that still is with us. <laughs> we are expert enough. And, and again, with this, there is no magic or formula. You have to really be careful and, and be prepared, equipped with proper knowledge and practice. Do not be over-identified with that. Those things are there, but I'm not that. And as you mentioned, how I can positively do something with that, I can express wonder, like, wow, such a potential I have for darkness. I can become a serial killer. I mean, we all have the potential to become an Adolf Hitler. It's not that he was such a bad guy and I always, I mean, if you play, if you don't put a filter to your darkness, who knows where that will end. <laughs> you follow? So if you have a glimpse of that and that glimpse is, overwhelming enough it's like whoa <laughs> so, then you immediately have to be like expert and positive say but what if i take all that density and energy and capacity potential you know, and express that in the direction of of the gift that is knocking my door keeps knocking my door even at this moment that i'm seeing i'm such a mess but in, in my back is you know, mahaprabhu is calling hey it's me here also. No, not forget me. I'm, I'm still give, extending my hand to you. So, so we have to express this wonder. Wow, what's, what capacity I have for darkness? But that's the, the half of the story, if you will, only. The other half is, what if I redirect all this capacity and energy in the context of bhakti, of this opportunity? How much wonder will, will there be? You know? <laughs> Because I'm, I'm having this great capacity to do nonsense all by myself under the influence of Maya, which is a limited energy, and me, and so small and insignificant, and I have such potential for darkness. <laughs> what if I exercise that potential not by myself, but in the Sangha of the Sadhus, with the grace of Gurudev and Mahaprabhu? How much that potential will be maximized, <laughs> upgraded? <laughs> And what a brilliant future is awaiting for me. So in that way, you, you, you went through this exercise of acknowledging your shadow, not being naive, but concluding on the positive side, on the brilliant side of the equation. And still you have to work with your shadow. <laughs> the shadow is there. <clears throat> but you are concluding looking at the sun, if you will. No? And you realize, oh, this sun is way more powerful. So I will work on the shadow by looking at the sun, if you will. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm not putting the shadow below the carpet, like being evasive. There's nothing there. No, no. There's something there, but there is something there. <laughs> As I said yesterday, my shadow is still a shadow. No? It's, what's the shadow in comparison to the original, if you will? No? So, so in this way, we should be like skillful. Intelligent in dealing with our inner struggles and thing in a way that always concludes in something positive and, and, and that increases our a whole. You can you can measure your progress in bhakti, but how many times you say a whole every day? Some a whole charanari, just some so many it's a whole. Yeah. Okay. Something else. <laughs> Just a little question. The filter you mentioned to put a filter on your shadow. I say that? The, yeah, you said you have to put a filter on your shadow. Okay, let, continue, continue the question. Yeah, so I wasn't sure quite what you meant. Afterwards, you said uh, look at the sun. Uh -huh. So, was that what the sun? I don't, I'm not sure if I use that term to, to filter our shadow, but anyhow, the idea that I meant was like. I mean, we have our shadow, if you will. We have to acknowledge that, to re accept it's yeah. there. No? None, we have to do something with that. But that's not the all, the end of the story. That's not the main part of the story. So we should work on that by having our attention into the direction of the sun. I'm some symbolic example. In this case, the sun is our bright future and potential in connection to... Sri Guru, Vaishnav, Sri Krishna. So, while having in order in prior in order of priority, first comes their mercy, 
And by having that in place, I can look at this. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's filter. I never use the word filter, I think. Maybe it's just that you have the negative. You, put, you, you don't put the, the your, your shadow away. You uh -huh. This way you use it. Okay. But it was not used in the positive. I have the recording. We'll go later again back there. <laughs> No. no problem. I think the idea is clear. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. They are just words. No problem. We can use the words in so many ways. But the, the idea basically is Krishna Surya, some Maya high on the car. Yeah. 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 Exactly. 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 Keep in mind that who you are is all that you can be, as we say yesterday. Your potential is who you actually are in the eyes of Krishna and the Sadhu. So. And that that deserves a lot of a whole. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Question can be little. I don't know the answer. Let's see. Where does Brahma? Oh, okay. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. We can say something about that, yeah, of course. I plan to speak about that at the end of the whole series, which won't happen here, but I continue later, so I'll share some words. So Brahma, <clears throat> Brahma, as you mentioned, as we mentioned, he wants to taste Sakya Bhav, hmm? but still he's, he's, a, he's a sadaka here. It's a work in progress. No, he's a practitioner. He hasn't reached perfection. And as I said yesterday to Krishna Chandra Prabhu, the day before yesterday, Brahma realizes I committed lots of offenses here. I offended the form of Krishna because I thought this is an imposter. I offended the associates of Krishna because I tried to kidnap them. And I offended the Leela of Krishna because I tried to interrupt the picnic. So I have committed Rupa Aparad, Parishad Aparad, Lila Parad, so Brahma is like, oh my God, I made a mess here. But <laughs> although he offended Krishna's form, Lila associate, the name of Krishna stayed with Brahma, never left Brahma. And that's why Brahma, it is said that he was born then in Gaur Lila's Namacharya Haridas Thakur. No. So Haridas Thakur is Brahma in Gaur Lila. So Brahma in Krishna Lila, if you will, <laughs> he realizes all these apparats, but he didn't offend the name. So the name stuck with, remained with him. How much the name accompanied Brahma? Well, he became Namacharya. <laughs> so the name was with him for sure. So it is said that as Haridas Thakur, he, Brahma obtained finally his ultimate uh, desire and destination in, 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 in Sakya Bhav in the Braj. There are different opinions among sadhus, of course. This is one particular perspective that I share according to what I learned from my Guru Maharaj. So Brahma becomes eventually enters Sakya Bhav in, in Vrindavan. And so there is happy end to the story here. No? So, <laughs> but some Bimohan has to be... That really helps us to illustrate our own journey also. No? Because we want to practice, we receive something, oh, this is so nice, I want that, and then we make some mistakes, oh my God, be Mohan. But then the grace comes through Nam, stays with us, and we can, by the grace of Gaur Lila, attain also Krishna Lila, Yatayata, Gaur, Apadara, Vindam, Kita Punyarasi. Sorry, you have a question? Yes. yes. <laughs> but um, how can one offend the name of God? What, what would be... Well, that's a long, a whole separate series of okay. lectures, not only one lecture, okay. but <clears throat> there are a list of Nama apparats that we know that also we were speaking. I mean, Krishna Chandra Prabhu wrote, no, you didn't write the book about Nama Paraya, yeah, you speak about that in the positive. Yeah. So he has a book on the topic. So with all, I give you homework okay. to do and study yeah. Krishna Chandra Prabhu's book. <laughs> That he will try to show from a positive light how we can avoid offenses to the name, which actually the real question is how can I increase my affection for the name? That, that's the best orientation. Like, because sometimes, and with this, I, I close 
I've seen many devotees go in neurotic with this idea of aparad. No. Offenses. Be careful. Do not offend. Do not step on Maharaj's shadow. You will offend Maharaj. No. Better you don't walk on my shadow because I, I will curse you. Uh, <laughs> this is the whole reason why I have this thing here, basically. <laughs> I'm joking. No. But my point is sometimes people think like that. Look, oh, there comes a sannyasi. Everyone should be afraid of him or something like that. All this nonsense. <laughs> but my point is how to avoid offenses. That's not the question. The real question is how can I increase my love and affection for Guru, Vaishnav, Srinam. And if you are sincerely wanting to develop your affection for the name, there can be no offense. You may make some mistake without in bad intention, but that's not an offense. You follow my point? Now, if, if you didn't know that you shouldn't be doing that, and you do that, that's not an offense. Now, if you do, if you know, I don't know. It's like the crime. Yeah, crime with there is some intention, or not? But if you know you shouldn't do that, yes. and still you do it, that's another thing. But if you are sincerely wanting to please Krishna, Guru, Vaishnav, you are open to learn what do they like, what they don't like. They have their own taste. They are persons. So you try to align yourself to that, and you are sincerely do not, There's no possibility of offense. To, for offense to be there, you have to have wrong intention. You have to be hypocritical. These type of things, which are, of course, not part of being a devotee, basically. Envious. But if you are sincerely trained to do things properly, no need to be offense, offense, offense. So can I ask one thing related to this? <laughs> Just, so if you chant uh, the, the holy names without mm. affection, mm -hmm. but you chant because they, you have been told chant, 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 you know, so that... Is going to be an offense or not? Because you feel like it's empty yeah. chanting. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it in black and white terms. I wouldn't say affection or without affection. You may be chanting without affection, but wanting to chant with affection. <laughs> so that's the beginning of affection, <laughs> because we we don't have prem. So I cannot just imitate prem bhakti. I cannot press an automatic button. Okay. Prem Bhakti on. And shh, it doesn't happen. But I would like to. I have that idea. That ideal came to me. And I'm far. Mahaprabhu expressed this in the second verse of Sikshastakam. In each verse of Sikshastakam, he's showing the different stages of Bhakti in chanting. And before saying, I'm crying in separation and so many nice things, he's saying, I don't feel anything. Durdaiva Midrisham Mihajjanina Anura. His first three lines, he's expressing so much appreciation for the name. Nam Namakari Bahuda Niyasharvasak. So many names, all Shaktis in all these names, all your mercy in all these names. Oh, you are so merciful. But Durdaiba Midrisham Mihajanin Anurag. But I'm so unfortunate that I don't have Anurag. I don't have love for this. But he's lamenting for that, wanting to have love. So he's crying for that. So, so as Prabhupada Bhaktisiddhanta once said, <clears throat> he said, we should cry for Krishna. And everyone was like, it's not happening. <laughs> so someone asked, so what if I cannot, I, I cannot cry for Krishna? Because you cannot imitate crying. You cannot go to a drama school and learn to cry and just make a show. That's not the crying he was speaking about. So, so someone asked, what if I cannot cry for Krishna? So he said, then you should cry because you cannot cry. <laughs> like implying you should reach some point of realistic lamentation in a healthy way, not, not depressed, <laughs> not suicidal, not depressed, but healthy repentance and praying for mercy, humility. And that's the beginning of love. That's humility. The, in the third verse, Mahaprabhu speaks about humility. No? Third verse, Trinada, peace. But second verse also, he speaks about humility, another t type of humility. Before you reach, you, before you become humbler than the blade of grass, you have to repent. I don't have love for Krishna, but but I will like, and the mercy is so great. And that's the beginning of love. 
that's humility. Humility and prem are synonymous, basically. One is causing the other to grow. So, so in that sense, I will say there, there's no love, but there is love in one sense. In that sense, there is no offense. Offense will be... I don't care. I don't care. Indifference, such a great thing, Cam. I know it's great, and I mistreat that, and I just do it. Yeah, indifference, and that's another thing. You're mistreating the gift. No? Such a gift is coming, and you're just like... Don't care. Chilo Maras wants to say to conclude, the only thing that Krishna is asking from us, <clears throat> he said, it's a little bit of collaboration to accept the gift. It's like if I want to give you a gift, and I say, this is the greatest gift you can receive. And he's, I, the only thing I'm asking from you is just put your hand to receive the gift. Collaborate. Help me. Put the hand. And the, everything else I'm doing, my Krishna say I'm doing myself. You just put the hand like this famous so pic, pa paint. That to him when you put the flower peel on him. Collaborate, yeah. Krishna Chandra. Collaborate. <laughs> Accept the affection of your of the devotees. <laughs> that's accepting their affections. That's humbling. So we should accept the garland as its symptom. Okay, this increasing my humility is their love of me. So their love will make me more humble. With all respect, they are <laughs> they are requesting that. <laughs> In their service, in your service. <laughs> no more excuse for rejecting garlands now. <clears throat> so we have only to accept, make some effort to accept the gift. It seems simple, but sometimes it's different, difficult. That this famous painting of Mich Mich Michelangelo, that God is like extending, trying to, to give the gift. Oh, help me. Thank you. <laughs> on, on, on the other side. He knows the painting better than me. <laughs> we are on the other side, like, like, mm, I don't think it's worthy. I don't know if I, uh, And God is desperate with all his associates, like, just take it, take it, please help. I will, like, mm. Your comfort zone, no? Like, from the sofa, like, I don't know if it's worthy of my effort to do, like, this. <laughs> It's embarrassing. We are laughing, but we should be we should be crying actually. <laughs> so Sila Samara said that's what is asked from us. It's not too much, just accept the gift. But sometimes we are so conditioned, it feels like too much. <laughs> but when we grow and we become humble, we realize it's nothing. It's, everything is I'm I'm not doing I have to do something, but in, by comparison, what I'm doing, but I have to do that part myself. I cannot expect Krishna to do it. To re receive the gift he is giving me <laughs> makes no sense. No, Krishna, receive your own gift. No, you need the gift, Krishna. Say you have to receive. It. So that's what we are trying to do as sadhakas here. Try to train our hand to extend it and receive the gift and trust the giver of the gift. Generally, we don't put the hand because we are still like as we say yesterday. No, mm, I don't know. If I'm sure. I don't know if you are trustworthy. So gradually we have to be convinced how sweet and how merciful Krishna is and how we should open our hearts and give all to him. Anyhow, two hours already. So we will stop here with your permission. Sri Lagurudev Ki Jai. Sri Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. Sri Harinam Sankirtan Ki Jai. Sri Sri Gaur Gadhadarju Ki Jai. Grantara Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Sri Brahma Stuti Ki Jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrind Ki Jai. Gaur Pramanan Haivu. Ancha Kalpataru Vyascha Kasantasyevacha Paditanam Pavanipyo Vaishnavipyo Namon Nanta Koti Vaishnavrindaki Gaur Haribo Haribo